everyone. Uh, welcome to Dak 1319 uh, and Chapter 11 of Loosening the Grip. Uh, and you're going to have a kind of a real bastardized lecture today because I'm having some real technical issues up here in Utah. Uh, the good news is I'll be back in Texas um, tomorrow, so... <coughs> Uh, that, that'll be something, but that's tomorrow's not today, right? Uh, and so I want to get started here right away, share my screen with you, and I'm going to go from uh, the early intro part of a PowerPoint into the chapter itself. Uh, and uh, again, that's due to uh, some, some technical issues. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to do that. And we'll get into chapter 11, which is special populations. Uh, there we go. Or is it there we go? There we go. Uh, special populations. Uh, what, what is a special population anyway? Uh, we're divided out and to all kinds of groups throughout our life. We're, we fit into homogenous systems and we felt in, fit into heterogeneous uh, uh, groups as well. Uh, we, are, we have age, sex, gender, sexual orientation, politics, religion, uh, and all of that. Uh, are ways that we subdivide into uh, special populations. So consequently, everyone is a special population in, in, in some way or another. And most of the time, uh, when we think of special populations, we think of diversity and we think of ethnicity and stuff like that. Uh, we think of race. Those are... Uh, special populations, but they're not the only one. Uh, we have, in our clientele, dealing with people, age is very important uh, in the way we work with people, the way we work with children versus the way we work with adolescents the way versus the way we work with adults and the way we work with seniors. Nationality uh, is uh, an important aspect to consider, and whether so, and uh, immigration status, legal status for that matter, disabilities, economic status, where you come from, what you can afford, what you can pay for, uh, your religious beliefs, etc. So all of these define special populations, and all of us, every one of us, falls uh, into a special population one way or another. Age is the first thing that we're going to look at, and adolescence being the uh, uh, first issue that we look at in age. Adolescence is, uh, is, is very strange. Uh, uh, Ogden Nash, the poet, who's pretty funny <laughs> in all of his poems, really, uh, all of his work, uh, notes uh, somewhat famously that you're only young once, but you can stay immature indefinitely. And there's certainly truth to that. Uh, human beings develop throughout our lifespans. We're always changing uh, based on circumstances, uh, experiences, uh, uh, knowledge, and knowledge acquisition and applications and things like that relationships with people uh, physiologically uh, changes. So adolescence is really a temporary condition and basically it's also a modern construct. What you see here on the uh, on this page is Tony and Maria uh, from West Side Story, the film. Uh, and West Side Story's been produced 900 ways from nowhere, from, uh, you know, uh, middle school productions uh, on up to Hollywood. Uh, and West Side Story is basically Romeo and Juliet, which, is, uh, which was a, an old story even in Shakespeare's time, uh, and Shakespeare ripped it off too. <laughs> 
So, uh, but this is the, the the great love story of our time, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, uh, the the height of uh, European rom uh, uh, you know romantic uh, theater, uh, and these are the the youngsters whose pure love was the example of uh, uh, of uh, of commitment to one another in romance. Romeo and Juliet were 17 and 14 years old, uh, uh, respectively. Uh, Romeo and Juliet's parents uh, were at odds with one another. Romeo and Juliet's parents forbid them uh, to, uh, to, uh, to date, basically, to, to be together. Uh, there was intrigue, there was murder, there was drug use, there was suicide. If Romeo and Juliet were growing up right now in Baytown, Texas, and they brought them to our offices, we would have their little fannies in treatment so fast they wouldn't know what hit them. Uh, so it was a, a, a different set of circumstances uh, going on uh, with them. Adolescence. In, in America uh, and in Europe too, and uh, adolescence was kind of invented. Uh, once upon a time, uh, that uh, uh, you know, we didn't care uh, what uh, people uh, did at what age. The the law, for instance, was the law. It didn't matter if you were six years old, sixteen, sixty six, or whatever. Uh, you got the same types of punishment for the same types of crimes. Uh, over time, we begin to kind of mellow out on the way that we treated younger people. Uh, we kind of adopted uh, a statutory age limit from English common law. Someone has to be 21 years old to come into the majority. Uh, a person of uh, assigned to the manor born, for instance, might be mature enough to handle his father's armor at 14 or 15 years old and be able to wear it. He wouldn't be mature enough to be able to run the estate, to lead troops into combat, and all the other things that uh, uh, a, a lord uh, would have to do at the time. So 21 became a kind of an arbitrary age. But it was not uncommon for, uh, for women to be married and uh, mothers by the age of uh, 14, sometimes to much older men. Uh, so this whole notion of this extended childhood that we call adolescence is, uh, is, is a new deal by, um, uh, by uh, uh, American, by, by world standards. So, uh, the first special population we're going to look at is that uh, adolescence uh, uh, phenomenon. And adolescence, uh, a lot of you, uh, I'll say a lot of you, some of you uh, anyway, are going to be interested in working uh, with this group of people. And adolescence is... Uh, uh, you know, I remember my teen years. They weren't they weren't fun, to tell you the truth. I was uh, I was kind of living in a world of doubt, not you know knowing how I fit in or where I fit in or who was who or what was what was a dress right, etc. Uh, you probably went through that too. And I listened to the right music, hanging out with the right crowd, all of that. Uh, and it was mattered much more to me what my peers thought than what my uh, than what my parents thought. Uh, boys and girls develop differently, and this shows up. This begins to show up well before the teenage years, um, six and seven uh, years old, with with girls who uh, tend to uh, start being. Um, it, well, they can compete with boys at that time. There's not a lot of real physiological differences. Uh, then there's a growth spurt for girls who get, uh, who get, uh, uh, who develop faster than guys, get taller than guys. It's not uncommon at the same age for girls to be taller than the boys and more physically mature. Uh, anyway.
anyway, and that can be very confusing uh, for uh, girls to uh, girls practice uh, uh, their maturation with one another too. That's something to behold. Those of you that have raised girls know what I'm talking about. They practice walking, standing. They even practice crisis habit, getting together with one another to uh, uh, to uh, uh, have emotional breakdowns over this, that, or the other, uh, and turning into little drama queens. Guys do uh, their own thing, and they can, it can be very dramatic, too. Uh, some of this is physiological. Puberty's coming on, and when puberty hits, things get crazy. You've got all these hormones going on in your body, and, um, and you've got developmental tasks that you've got to, uh, uh, that you're saddled with, that you need to, um, uh, learn how to deal with too, uh, how to how to uh, uh, form relationships, make friends, dealing with your sexuality, that kind of stuff, all happens around this time of life. Uh, you have growth spurts, uh, uh, and people worry about that. Girls worry uh, about how they're uh, how they're developing physically. Boys worry about how they're developing physically. Do I have enough hair on my chest? Is my voice deep enough? Am I, am I, can I grow uh, a beard? Uh, uh, one of the um, things that uh, uh, that uh, uh, girls worry about sometimes is getting their period at the same time with their peers. Uh, and something that's somewhat common for girls, I mean, it's, I ask not every day, but... Uh, uh, some girls will have differences in the way their breasts develop. One's getting a little larger than the other one, and you've got to deal with that kind of thing. Uh, so it can be a uh, it can be a time of uh, of confusion, of um, of uh, I can't, I'm losing my word. I can't think of what, what word I'm trying to say. Uh, a time of confusion and disappointment in 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 oneself uh, and fear of not uh, fitting in, fear of ostracization and stuff like that. Uh, adolescence is a time of two steps forward and one step back, uh, and there's a you know there's a, a terrific amount of uh, of um, absolutism that takes place in uh, adolescence where you either love something or you hate it. Uh, there's no middle ground, you know. Uh, so uh, in these developmental stages that are going on with teenagers in uh, 21st century America, uh, there's a framework for thinking about uh, how uh, kids move through this. Early adolescence, middle adolescence, late adolescence, etc. Uh, but uh, and each of them can be defined by certain developmental tasks, and it's very much in line with uh, Eric Erickson's psychosocial stages of development that we talk about in uh, the theories class, where you have tasks that you have to master at certain stages in life, uh, and. Uh, some of the things that adolescents are mastering is how to define yourself as a person. Who are you going to be? How are you going to be? Uh, how to define yourself in terms of your sexuality, what you feel, how to express it, etc., and so forth. Uh, who you are in terms of your political, social identity, who you are in your religious identity, who you are in terms of your independence from your parents or dependence upon other people. And it's during this time of your life when you're supposed to be learning to make adult relationships. This is the period of time in your life when you're uh, supposed to be learning to, um, uh, you know, to find a partner, to start, you know, to, to get ready to start a family, to start uh, uh, on your um uh, on your way uh, uh, professionally or occupationally. And uh, once upon a time, by the age of 14, 15, 16 years old, you were expected to, to be there. I mean, uh, you know, 
wasn't that long ago uh, that you were a man or a woman in the United States of America uh, by the age of 15. The, uh, uh, the developmental tasks uh, are present you with problems that are confusing, that are frightening, uh, and you're supposed to work through them. That's what you're doing at this stage of life and at this stage of your development. And you're supposed to be confused, and you're supposed to uh, second-guess yourself, and you're supposed to work through this, and you're supposed to learn how to delay gratification and stuff like that. If you have been around recovery groups long or, uh, you know, have been involved in the treatment world at all, uh, you probably heard that people who are chemically dependent who started using drugs during this period of their life may suffer from uh, arrested development. In other words, if you start getting high at 15 years old, then your emotional development starts at 15 years old, or stops at 15 years old. And when you sober up again at, say, 32, 33, 34, 35, uh, you're grown up physically, you're a grown man, woman, whatever, but you're emotionally stunted and your emotional development is back. And sometimes, uh, to a certain degree, your intellectual development is hung up in middle adolescence. Uh, that idea has been somewhat debunked in our modern era, uh, but there's still an element of truth to it. Uh, when you're, uh, uh, for instance, when I, 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 I like girls uh, and uh, women, uh, but I've always found them a little bit mysterious and scary from time to time in my life, many times in my life. But uh, as, a, as an adolescent boy who's already insecure in the way he looks and the way he speaks and who he hangs with and is he good enough or do, does the opposite sex find me attractive? Uh, and, uh, the, and, and, and gay people go through this too. Are the people I'm attracted to, do they find me attractive? That's probably a better way to think of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, how do I deal with my relationship with girls? How do I start a conversation with girls? How, what, what do I, how do I handle rejection? Uh, this kind of thing. Once upon a time in my life, and pretty much in everybody's life too, like in childhood, pre-adolescence, uh, pre-teen, uh, if third grade Howard uh, likes third grade Sally across the room, uh, in, in school, uh, I will go to my friend Ronnie Joe and say, you know, Ronnie, I like Sally, and Ronnie Joe will go to uh, to Sally's uh, friend Bobby Joe and say, you know, uh, Howard likes Sally, and then Sally will tell Bobby Joe, uh, oh, he, he's great. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to him to be my boyfriend or. You know, oh no, not that dude. I wouldn't touch him with a stick. Uh, and then Bobby Joe will tell Ronnie Joe, and Ronnie Joe will tell me. And based on that information loop, I'll know whether I should proceed uh, with writing her notes and letting her chew my bubble gum or whatever the hell we do at that age. Uh, and it was very civilized. I don't know why we abandoned that, but we did. Now, if I see a girl and I like her, I've got to start up a conversation with her myself. And I have to be very careful with that in the modern era, by the way. Um, so if I, if, if I do this thing, I'm running a real risk of rejection. And so I'm frightened. And sometimes this frightened and insecure feeling that I have prevents me from doing anything at all. I'm kind of paralyzed. You're supposed to work through this kind of stuff. And all of that is real. It's not fantasy. I mean, you know, the, 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 the likelihood of rejection is always there. The likelihood of liking someone who doesn't like you back is always a possibility. So, um, uh, so what do I do? Do I take the risk? Do I uh, make this effort on 
uh, on part of uh, on my own part with uh, initiating this with a girl uh, and and run the fear of rejection. Yeah, or no? You know what? Why don't I just have a drink? When I have a drink, I've discovered, based on the Johnson's model of learning the mood swing, that if I have a drink or two drinks, I don't find that girl as scary as I did when I was sober. And if I have a couple more drinks, I can talk to her. And a couple more drinks, I can actually dance with her. And a couple more drinks, I'll ask her daddy to dance. I don't give a damn. Uh, so, uh, as I put to sleep that part of my brain that cares, it feels like I'm uh, solving a problem and I'm maturing and, you know, and doing things properly. But what I've done is I've taken a developmental shortcut and I'm using uh, alcohol, not as a beverage, not in a convivial sense, but as a, a medication to basically uh, medicate my insecurities around this. Uh, and that does lead to de uh, to uh, to some developmental uh, issues in adolescence. And you will, if you're in this business for any length of time, you'll run into people who sober up in their 30s or 40s, but they're still operating on uh, uh, an adolescent emotional plane. And that's what people are talking about by the uh, arrested development. Somewhere in my youth... Uh, my relationship skills devolved into, can I buy you a drink? Do you want to go up to my place and twist up a doobie? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and whereas that may work uh, in my teenage years, it doesn't work very much as I get older. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that, but I'm not going to say it. Um so developmental tasks suffer, uh, you know, the acceptance of my biological ro role, who am I going to be physically, the struggle to become comfortable with my sexuality, and this happens uh, a lot uh, with, uh, you know, with all of us who are, uh, when we're growing up, um, who we're attracted to, and, uh, you know, how we express that attraction, how we deal with that attraction, uh, and who's attracted to us, you know. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of times when people uh, are more worried about who's attracted to, to us, uh, that th we worry more about who's attracted to us than who we're attracted to. Um, so why, why do guys hit on me? What am I doing? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, occupational and social identity. This is a big deal for some. Uh, there are a lot of kids who uh, make a, a decision early on about who they're going to be when they grow up and they stick with that plan, uh, a number of kids. There are more of us who just kind of drift along and fall into things. And there are plenty of us who make a decision when we're teenagers about who and how we're going to be when we're older and we stick with it even though we don't like it and it's not satisfying uh, toward us, etc. Uh, there can be major conflicts when it comes time to break away from parents. And this hurts parents' feelings sometimes. Uh, when your bestest little buddy for the last dozen years or so uh, doesn't want to walk with you at the mall, wants to walk across the hall from you and either ahead of you or behind you so that people won't think you're together. Uh, because one of the worst things that can happen to a 13, 14-year-old kid is for other kids to find out they have parents. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is normal. It's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, and kids uh, and boundaries in families uh, have a lot to do with how children, uh, uh, you know, respond to this uh, sort of circumstances. So uh, the, the developmental tasks are there in adolescence. Now you're throwing in things like uh, uh, drug use and, uh, you know, uh, uh, emerging sexuality. Uh, 
going out drinking, being sexually active, things like that, uh, can be very disturbing uh, to parents. And depending on where you are as a teenager and what your social circumstances are, uh, certain looks are expected of you by the crowd you hang with. Certain behaviors, including drug use, are expected behaviors with the crowd you, that you hang with. And other things, sexual uh, uh, activity uh, is expected by the crowd that you hang with. Uh, when, as a teenager growing up, I was, you know, uh, in, a, in a period where when I first got to high school, you didn't tell uh, uh, my first year of high school, you, you didn't tell people that you smoked weed or that you were running around drinking because, you know, it, you could be socially ostracized for doing that. And uh, girls wouldn't go out with you and stuff like that. Before I graduated high school, everybody was smoking weed, or at least it seemed that way dropping acid, doing other drugs, and sex had become, uh, had, had moved from a no-no uh, to about as significant as a handshake. There were pregnancies and things like that going on. Uh, uh, in my time, in my school, among my crowd, uh, homosexuals still got a really rough time of it. I remember a kid, uh, who was in my, in my, from my junior class, who hanged himself because of it. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it, it was tough. Uh, and he got no support uh, from uh, hardly anyone, actually, including me. I didn't know, you know, how to, how to support him, really. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so it was, it was a sad case. His parents didn't uh, support who he was. They basically ignored who he was. Uh, so, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, so things change. Society changes. Mores and values change. One of my friends, uh, Dr. Myra Barnes, who was a co-author of a book with me, uh, I... Um, uh, dropped by her house one day and she was all dressed up, looked very nice and I asked her, uh, where are you going? She said, well, I'm, I'm not going, I'm coming. I, I just got back from a, a party at the school where I used to teach and she said uh, they had a bridal shower for one of the teachers there, a, a young teacher uh, who, was, uh, who was pregnant and she said, you know, things have so changed since when I started teaching. And I said, how's that, Myra? And she said, uh, this woman doesn't have a husband. And she said, uh, uh, and it, we're giving her a shower. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, she'd been fired, and we'd have run her out of town. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be here pregnant without a husband. It's just not going to happen. So, uh our society changes, and our development, uh, the development of our children changes over time. Uh, how much time should we allow our kids to have with video games, on computers, you know, et cetera, and so forth? The, these were not concerns that my parents had. These were not concerns that I had, uh, you know, with, uh, with my children. The, the, these are concerns with my grandchildren. This is a, a, a modern time uh, for them. Alcohol and drug use was pretty common, uh, and some of that came from family. Uh, as I'm coming up as an adolescent, I'm getting these messages from uh, people around me, from grown from grown ups, uh, that it's okay to do certain things. Uh, I drank with my father, for instance, uh, when I was 17. He would uh, take me out and buy me alcohol and stuff, and he would say things to friends, and we'd be sitting at a table drinking, uh, and he'd say, well, yeah, I'll allow Howard to drink with me, because if he drinks with me, he's not going 
uh, you know, out there in the streets and doing it. He's not doing it, uh, you know, slipping around, drinking it, and he's not doing drugs. Well, surprise, <laughs> you know. I was, sometimes I had so many drugs in me as a wonder my head didn't explode. Uh, but, uh, you know, and what I was doing with my father, I certainly did not draw the line with doing uh, uh, with my friends. Uh, and as my friend, and I was a light bloomer, I really didn't start using until I was 17. You know, it was just a, a, a thing. Uh, but uh, once I did, I uh, made up for lost time. And uh, this is a common experience for adolescents. We get messages around us, what should we do, how should we do it? Uh, and sometimes parents uh, support uh, that use and sometimes they don't. Of course, by the time someone is 16 or 17 years old uh, in the 10th, 11th, 12th, grades, uh, you know, they're, they're more concerned with what their friends are doing and how their friends are doing it, uh, and, um, and, and that's, the, that's the major influence there. This doesn't mean that we don't listen to our parents, by the way. Uh, talk to your kids if you're a parent. Continue to talk to them about drug use and abstinence and all that good stuff. They do listen. Uh, and sometimes it makes a terrific difference down the road a little bit. Uh, so does uh, prevention efforts. Prevention efforts help, and, rec and treatment efforts help. Uh, when I first got into uh, recovery, when I made my first attempt at uh, sobriety, I was 29 years old, and I came into the Palmer Drug Abuse Program uh, because I was way too cool for Alcoholics Anonymous and that kind of stuff. Uh, but... Uh, and uh, there was this uh, old guy, uh, Bob Meehan, who, uh, uh, who uh, was one of the founders of the program, along with Father Charlie and uh, uh, John Bradshaw. And uh, this was a program that had modified 12 steps it was primarily for adolescents. It was designed for, for kids, basically. So their steps were watered down uh, from the 12 steps. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, but what I witnessed coming in, and I have to admit to being somewhat uh, uh, patronizing with these younger kids, is like, oh my word, you got uh, you know you got busted with a joint. Oh, quel damage! <laughs> you know, come back when you develop a a drug problem. Uh, but um, what I discovered is even though these kids were brought in, dragged in by the ear by mama and dad, uh, and, uh, you know, they came in together, they got sober together, they worked a program together, they got discouraged together, they relapsed together and went their ways. Uh, and I'm thinking, what a waste of time with these youngsters. But as I stayed around and, you know, in, in recovery uh, and sometimes out, uh, finding my own path through through this, I discovered that some of those kids that were dragged in when they were 12, 13, 14, 15 years old into this drug program uh, were coming back on their own when they're in their 20s, 22, 23, 24, because they know there's something that can be done and they know there's a solution uh, for their problems. And so now they're showing up in 12-step uh, in meetings, AIA, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, and other type uh, treatment programs. Uh, so uh, whatever we do uh, with adolescents, we're doing something. A problem over the years with some of the programs that have been uh, brought to bear on adolescents is uh, that uh, things like tough love uh, is a get is basically in a, you know and I don't see any need to pull punches this stage of my career I guess uh, is a get even with your kid program uh, and so you know all right kid <coughs> you've been acting a fool and making me miserable since you turned. 
14 years old, and now it's my turn. Here's what's going to happen. And I lay down these laws and these harsh punishments, and I stick with them, and I kick them out of the house, and I cut off any kind of support, and I seize all their uh, uh, stuff that I gave them over the years, etc., and so forth. Uh, and if you want them back and you want to, uh, you know, whatever, then my way or highway. And there's, uh, you know, no room for failure or relapse or whatever. Um, and that's an approach. It doesn't work very well with most kids. It doesn't work very well with most kids. But it makes mom and dad feel like they're doing something. And I guess that's a positive in a sense. Um we can't let them run wild and do whatever they want to with no consequences, but that's probably not a good, uh, you know, good, a good approach either, the, 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 the tough love thing. And the tough love ideology began to permeate uh, uh, all kinds of treatment efforts. And so one of the things that you uh, uh, might hear from someone who works with adolescents is these kids just don't respect us. Uh, you know, they have no respect. And then uh, I, you know, I look at it from another perspective. And that's if authority is going to be respected, it should be respectable. And so some of the demands that are placed on adolescents who are trying to get sober and things like that are way more stringent. Than the, uh, uh, than the demands that are placed on adults. In some circumstances, it has to be that way. Some years back, in the 80s actually, a lot of years back, I had uh, a young lady who was a, a, a um, client at an agency where I worked who had, uh, and I didn't work with her very often, and mostly I worked with her parents, uh, although I, I did, um, you know, we, in working with them as a group, we, our paths crossed. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, she, uh, her counselor was another lady that worked at our agency. Uh, but I found out uh, in an interaction with her that uh, she had a boyfriend. Now, this girl was 15, I think, at the time, something like that. Her boyfriend was 26 or 27, and uh, she referred to him as her lover. Uh, and she said, you know, I, that's basically what she said. She said, my lover is, uh, you know, 20, I forget, 26, 27 years old, uh, to which I had to inform her Honey, you, your lover is not a lover. Your lover is a child molester. He's a rapist, you know, basically. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, that's the situation we're finding ourselves in. And we find that she likes to sneak out at night with her lover, and she's sexually active with her lover, and she drinks alcohol with her lover, and she does cocaine uh, with her lover. Uh, and I cannot keep this... Uh, to myself, right? So that per, uh, th that uh, uh, in itself is a dilemma that you sometimes face with adolescents that you don't face with other adults. I, if uh, you're 23 and you're sneaking out of the window of your parents' house, I don't feel obligated to inform your parents that you're doing that. I might point out to you that at the age of 23, there's some awfully bizarre behavior you're engaging in, but... Uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have to do that. And it doesn't matter to me uh, how old your lover is, if you're 23 or whatever. But if you're a child, it does. Uh, and so uh, adolescents are treated differently. They get in trouble for things that uh, wouldn't be a problem if they were old enough to do it. Buying a pack of cigarettes uh, when you're 15 can get you in trouble. Uh, drinking alcohol when you're 18 can get you uh, in trouble, but it won't if you're 21, right? Right. Uh, so uh, over the years, different uh, methodologies and ways of dealing with adolescents 
uh, have uh, have come up. Uh, I mentioned Palmer Drug Abuse Program early on, uh, I mean a while ago, and uh, Palmer Drug Abuse uh, Program early on noted that, uh, you know, it's a real hard pill for someone who's 15 years old to swallow uh, that I'm powerless over alcohol, that my life has become unmanageable. Is it the truth with some of them? Absolutely, it's the truth with some of them. But it's still a hard thing to get them to swallow, to accept, to admit to, and to believe in. So uh, they modified the steps. Uh, we admitted that we... Uh, uh, were partial that we admitted that we were powerful over some powerless over some of our drug use and that our lives had become partially unmanageable, something to that effect. It's been a while. Uh, we found it necessary to stick with winners in order to grow. The steps were changed around for uh, for teenagers, uh, and uh, we have found that uh, we found some other programs, and we'll talk about them later on. Uh, with special populations, with women, uh, etc., who have also modified that approach to suit uh, to to meet the needs of these uh, special populations. Uh, we worry about illicit uh, drug use trends. Uh, you've probably heard moving along about gateway. Uh, substances, gateway drugs, and we've always referred to alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, etc. as a gateway substance. And I'm not real militant one way or another on that as far as my own beliefs. Uh, I do know that smoking cigarettes or, uh, you know, smoking weed or drinking alcohol does not necessarily mean that you're going to move on to harder things. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you're going to stay with those things. Most people try a cigarette, try tobacco or something like that in their adolescence. All kids have an opportunity to do that. I mean, the opportunity presents itself to all of them. And what they do with that is kind of, uh, kind of up to them, right? Uh, and most kids who expect, most people, let me put it that way, it's probably a good idea to reiterate a fact and a reality of, uh, you know, of our existence, which is that most people who try illicit drugs do not become addicted to them. They just don't. Uh, they may make a mistake, give it a shot, say that was interesting, whatever, uh, they may even use them for a while, uh, but then they quit. Uh, and those are some puzzling people, aren't they? Uh, but that's the way they the way that they do it. Uh, some of the rest of us don't. A problem with adolescents, uh, for those who are going to become uh, drug addicts, is when you start using early, you move through the stages of addiction more quickly. It, it, it's faster. And I have seen kids who are 15, 16, 17 years old who um, are full-blown and gone chemically dependent. They're not borderline anything. They're not fooling around. They're not going through a stage. They're, you know, they started getting high and the brakes on the rest of their life were hit. And that's what they did. They, they, uh, uh, they got high. Uh, and I think the youngest addict I ever met was an 11-year-old girl, and I met her at a, uh, an AA meeting in Oxnard, California. Uh, and this little girl uh, had a pre-cirrhotic liver. Uh, and pre-cirrhotic liver is basically saying she's got cirrhosis, but it's not real bad yet. Uh, and her, uh, you know, at the age of 11, and she'd been getting drunk since she was three. Her little, her uh, older brothers used to like to get her drunk on wine because they thought it was funny. Uh, and they were kids, too. Uh, so the, this, you know, uh, it was very sad. Uh, but um, they didn't mean to hurt her or to do anything horrible to her. They were kids, too, and they were pretty innocent of the consequences that uh, um, would be there for all of them. So anyway, 
the point of the matter is most people who uh, use uh, don't get addicted. Some of us do. Uh, and uh, people who experiment with drugs in their teens, uh, most of them sail right through it and it becomes one of those. Eh, that was interesting things that, uh, you know, you can laugh with with your friends at high school reunions and so uh, For others, not so much. For the kids who do uh, get in trouble uh, with the drugs, as usually fairly obvious early on, it happens pretty quickly. Uh, and there are some specific drugs of abuse, even though they're not gateway drugs, they're still easy drugs to acquire. Uh, Vaping has become a thing, and that, and that totally puzzles me how vaping got to be popular. It's one of the silliest things I've ever seen people do. Uh, but people do vape, and, uh, you know, and it's not just water vapor. If you can taste it, you can smell it. Uh, it's chemicals, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a thing. Uh, and they're also able to uh, uh, utilize other drugs in their vaping equipment. Uh, you can do dabs in it, for instance, the uh, honey oil and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, there's a higher prevalence of drug use uh, with people who use uh, alcohol and tobacco uh, have a higher prevalence of using other drugs, but that doesn't mean that people who don't use alcohol and tobacco don't use other drugs. So uh, there, even though there are trends there, you have to take each individual, uh, you know, as an individual, see what's going on with, uh, what, uh, with that individual child. Adolescents uh, uh, use alcohol in a lot of different ways, and there's all sorts of associated problems with it. Uh, yours truly uh, passed a civic test. I made a 94 on it. Uh, I passed the test. I wrote the test. I carried it to Mr. Uh, 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 I can't remember his name now. He was my civics teacher. I carried it to Mr. Hall's uh, uh, desk, laid it down on it, went back to my desk and passed out and woke up about three periods later. No one bothered me. <laughs> he just left me asleep at my desk in the, in the classroom. I was so loaded. Uh, you know, I, 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 there's no accounting for this. I don't know how that happened. I was so loaded from my own estimation. I didn't feel like I could have spelled cat if you spotted me CA, but I did well enough to pass, you know, uh, a civics exam with a mid-range A. Uh, so, uh, drinking at school, is that a problem? Yeah, should be. Smoking weed at school, is that a problem? Should be. Uh, smoked in the bathroom, my Lord. You know what a hot box is on a cigarette? You did if you were smoking in the stalls. Uh, so, uh, teacher walks into the bathroom and it's a, a collective... <laughs> All of the cigarette butts uh, hitting the toilet uh, water at the same time. Uh, so, 24% uh, of high school seniors report having had five or more drinks in a row in the past two weeks. That, dear hearts, is called binge drinking. 28% uh, of high school seniors have been drunk in the past month. Adolescents who begin drinking before age 15 are five times more likely to develop uh, alcohol dependence than those who begin drinking at age 21. In a study of adolescents, 14 or 15 seen in an emergency room for life-threatening injuries, 71%, that's 7 out of 10, tested positive for alcohol or drugs. Uh, and yeah, it's generally one of those uh, you know, hold my beer and watch this situation. Uh, alcohol use problems are associated with an average of 1.5 fewer edu uh, years of education. A white paper that was written uh, oh, six or seven years ago uh, by uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Mary Hill, uh, from uh, some uh, 
studies that she did, the, the number one reason that uh, uh, college students drop out in their first semester are drug and alcohol related. Uh, in 2012, 5.2% of the 16 to 17 year olds and 13.5% of those 18 to 20 reported ha uh, having driven after drinking. Uh, you can read most of this yourself. In New York City, the fifth major cause of emergency department visits among teens is dangerously high alcohol levels, alcohol toxemia. In the United States, 71% of all deaths among youth and young adults, 10 to 19 years old, result from just four causes. Four causes. Motor vehicle crashes, other unintentional injuries, homicide, and suicide. And all of these are alcohol-related. Uh, that's... Uh, a totally astonishing and unacceptable statistic in my book. Uh, the use of alcohol and other drugs in early adolescence increases the risk of dropping out of school, becoming, becoming pregnant or impregnating someone, becoming a teenage parent, and living independently from parents or guardians in, uh, uh, prematurely. and when you're unprepared for it. Underage drinking is estimated to be responsible for 19.7% of all expenditures, money that's spent uh, trading or trying to prevent uh, alcohol use. Uh, I already talked about alcohol use and developmental tasks, but uh, uh, suffice it to say, that alcohol is a chemical shortcut uh, that doesn't work as well and doesn't work as long you know, and is, uh, uh, usually does not have as good outcomes as mastering developmental tasks the way you're supposed to master them head on on your own trial and error. Uh, what else do I want to say about adolescence? Uh, there are risk factors, and you should be hearing about this in your prevention classes too, because a lot of, a lot of our prevention efforts, or most of our prevention efforts, in fact, are geared toward adolescent to at-risk populations. Who, oh, excuse me. Uh, and uh, we look at community factors, peer factors, family factors, you know, et cetera, and so forth. There's, there are a lot of factors that are there. If you are in uh, uh, a neighborhood where uh, there's lots of gang activity, where there's high unemployment, where uh, there's a lot of adult substance use, et cetera, uh, you don't know very much about substance use, what substance use you've had modeled for you has been abuse, etc., and so forth. Uh, all of this increases your risk. There are also protective factors on the other end of that, uh, so that uh, if you have a good support system, if you are educated about drug and alcohol use, if your family is, uh, doesn't use, if you, you know, there's uh, basically, the opposite of the risk factors become uh, support factors uh, or protective factors is a better way of putting it. So uh, th these can be evaluated when working with adolescents and teenagers. And, uh, you know, when you're doing treatment for anyone as uh, adult or adolescent, uh, you look at the context of their lives, where they live, who they live with, you know, what kind of activities they engage in, where they work, etc., and so forth. Uh, and you're looking towards these with an eye towards, you know, what can be done with this to support and improve a likely positive outcome for treatment with this uh, individual. Uh, so it's it's not really a guessing game because a lot of this is evidence-based. These are the things that we know have worked and the things that we can use that are effective uh, to help us with these people. But as a predictive factor, still the very, very, very best predictive factor that we have going uh, 
uh, for us in who might have problems with drugs and alcohol are genetic. Uh, you know, if you come from a family and your grandparents were alcoholic and your parents were alcoholic and your siblings are alcoholic, that's not good news for you if you decide to drink because that's uh, it, it's not a hundred percenter. Uh, that doesn't mean for sure that you're going to be an alcoholic. It just increases your risk like 400%. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're four times more likely to develop a drinking problem than someone who doesn't have this genetic risk factor in their background. Uh, you're talking about cyber bullies and other problems there. I'll let y'all read that. Uh, peers are another source of risk. A lot of us, uh, myself included, uh, I didn't wake up one morning and said, man, you know, I really, really need to go out and develop a chemical dependency today, uh, which wouldn't have been likely anyway because I didn't know what a chemical dependency was. <laughs> you know? But uh, 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 most of us start drinking because someone else wants us to. And that's what happened with me. My buddies started drinking, my friends. And I resisted this for a while. You know, I didn't like the taste of alcohol, didn't like beer, didn't like whiskey. Uh, and I hadn't got enough in me to, to experience drunk. So if I went to a party, I'd get a can of beer and walk around with it all night, put enough of it in my mouth, so that I could smell a little beery. And then sometime during the night, I'd take it to the bathroom with me, pour it out, uh, and then come back and throw the can away and open another one uh, and so that people could see me open it uh, because I wanted to appear <laughs> to be doing this thing. I didn't know what uh, drunk was at the time. And uh, anyway, the... Uh, 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 so I started drinking because other people wanted me to start drinking. They, you know, and I wanted to fit in and I wanted to be part of this group of people. Uh, but, and this is also typical with adolescents, as I began to catch on to what this drinking and drugging business was about and began to invest more in it, my friends changed. The people that I was hanging with that only drank, like, you know, occasionally at parties and stuff, I started moving away from them quickly and uh, clicking up with people who drank a lot more and who did other things, like smoked weed and popped pills and th that kind of thing. So that by the time I was 19 years old, I was very diagnosable. You know, I'd, uh, I'd, I had my first... Uh, arrest, uh, the first time I'd ever been charged with a DWI, uh, and my first seizure uh, associated with drug use. So it's, you know, it moved along real quick for me. Um, and uh, that's uh, over a period of two years. Uh, and it takes uh, other drinkers sometimes uh, much longer to get there than, than, than I, but that was... Uh, um, I think that's also a genetic factor. Uh, anyway, so the risk factors uh, are such that, uh, uh, as, you know, it's not a guarantee that uh, if you come, if you have these risk factors that you be chemically dependent, it just increases the risk. And that's the way to think about it. Uh, protective factors, signs of possible problems. Uh, it, it is important to consider the signs of possible problems. Uh, you know, your people's friends. This, uh, if you're of a mind to and want to do this, you can go look up old anti-drug commercials, and you can probably find them on YouTube or on the internet or or, or whatever. Uh, uh, General Barry McCaffrey's behind one of the most famous ones. It was showed the frying pan, pan and an egg and said, this is your brain, and he uh, cracks the egg, throws it in the frying pan, is sizzling. And he says, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of questions behind that. <laughs> but uh, uh, if, you, if you look at some of those uh, 
commercials, they talk about adolescence. Uh, and they're scary commercials, uh, and they're designed to be scary to cause parents to go take your child down to, uh, uh, you know, to to uh, the Bay Area uh, Hospital or uh, uh, take them to, uh, you know, the Woodlands Hospital or, you know, the whichever one. Anyway, there were dozens of treatment centers that would uh, air these commercials. But this is, is your kid withdrawn? Does he not want to have anything to do with the family? Does he like to isolate in his room? Has he changed the, the music he listened to? Has he changed his friends? Does he wear different, uh, different styles of clothes? And yada, yada, yada. And I'm sitting there checking it off and going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Uh, and then I have to stop and think, uh, as a parent, this is what adolescents do. You know, less interest in school or family, social activities, sports, and hobbies. Is that a warning sign of drug use? Yes. Is it also a normal behavior among adolescents? Yes. Not bringing friends home. Is that a warning sign? Yes. Is it normal adolescent behavior? Yes. Failing to return home after school. Is that a warning sign? Yep. Is that normal adolescent behavior? Yep. Unaccounted for personal time. Is that a warning sign? Yep. Is it normal adolescent behavior? Yep. Every one of these that you see here uh, can be accounted for just by saying this is a 16-year-old. This is a 17-year-old. Uh, and, you know, the, the old friends drop, new group of friends, attendance at parties, etc., so forth, strange phone calls. That, could that indicate drug use? Sure it could. Now, in my, in my case, and I use me as an example because I'm most familiar with my own case, uh, but uh, the friends I started high school with are not the friends I finished high school with. Uh, you know, and uh, the friends uh, uh, that I brought with me along the way from elementary through junior high up until my senior high school days, they weren't there. Uh, a lot of the people that I was friends with in high school or in my teenage years, I remained friends with all my life. Uh, but many others, you know, aren't there. That's that whole developmental over the life uh, uh, changes over the lifespan things. Your interests change. Your you know there are all kinds of changes that take place, uh, and uh, it's not because I didn't drop friends or things like that. This was just sort of a normal thing, a developmental thing that occurred, uh, and uh, a thing that uh, is a component of working with adolescents, and uh, but here's some other uh, uh, warning signs, if you will, indicators as you go along there. Uh, but uh, a, a thing that kids worry about coming into treatment sometimes, I've had, you know, adolescents just look me in the eye and say, hey, I don't give a shit what you say, I'm not going to give up my friends. You know, that is not going to happen. I'm drawing that line right now before we get started. Uh, and my usual response to that is don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I'm not asking you to give up your friends or to not be friends with people that you're friends with. I'm just asking you to try some new things and maybe hang out with some new people for a change, you know, here at the recovery center. And uh, uh, I don't tell them what I know about adolescent drug use, which is if you straighten up uh, and your friends are pretty uh, dedicated stoners, they're going to drop you. <laughs> they're not going to want you around. They're going to stop inviting you over, coming by, etc., like that, if you, if you remain sober. But um, anyway, uh, so uh, teenagers have a lot of concerns that are not necessarily the concerns of older people. Uh, older people who have that emotional adolescent arrested development that we've talked about, and I've seen uh, 
Uh, I'm thinking of uh, a certain person who happens to be a daughter of mine who is uh, uh, way too old to be having the adolescent dramas that she tends to have had regularly throughout uh, her life. I'm not putting her down. I'm not saying anything uh, about that, about her worth as a person. I'm just saying uh, she's, you know, when she came to me, she was already 13. And, uh, uh, you know, she had already been getting high and that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, that was... Um, and, I, I, you know, I'm not putting her down for it. I'm just saying that that's some consequences, you know. When you start getting high at that young an age, then you pay for it later on. Uh, you sober up and wonder, what am I supposed to do now? and still have the teenage drama going on. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, i talk about the Johnson model again. I don't think I want to do that. Uh, so teenagers do develop and suffer from, uh, uh, from, uh, alcohol use disorders, and other substance use disorders. Uh, the diagnostic criteria with, uh, that we use with adults is not a perfect fit for teenagers. Uh, they have different types of issues and different patterns of use, and they have different treatment outcomes, and they respond better uh, to, to some things than they do to others. Uh, and a lot of times for kids, they don't want to be abstinent. Uh, they come in and say, why can't I smoke a joint with a friend every once in a while? Uh, and, you know, the truth of the matter is, shh, this is just between us, that very often that's not going to be a problem. You know, uh, when we're pushing abstinence on, uh, on anyone, uh, and if, you're, if you have a chemical dependency, if you have an, uh, a dependency disorder, uh, then it's not safe for you to use anything. And we'll talk about that a little later on in another, uh, uh, in another special population. Uh, but, uh, you know, some, uh, some drug use, some, uh, uh, you know, so-called recreational drug use may lead to a relapse on their part. Other times it, it doesn't. So uh, looking at uh, a risk model is a way to... Uh, understand that and to gauge uh, the likelihood of it being a problem. Uh, if I can get them to not do it at all, then that's the best outcome for me. I mean, there's no adolescent drug use that's okay. Uh, you have to break laws to do it. You have to do antisocial behaviors to do it, etc. and so forth. Uh, working with adolescents, oh my God, it can be draining. Uh, and honestly, they're not my favorite population. They uh, 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 frustrate me. <laughs> and uh, uh, their energy levels are um, through the roof. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm by nature and temperament, uh, uh, geared more appropriately towards working with uh, working with adults. Uh, but one of the things that I found uh, uh, kind of frustrating about working with kids, and again, uh, I'm not, you know, trying to... Uh, I've had kids who, uh, you know, I, honestly, I... I just would like to write them a check and say, here's $500 and that's West. Go that way that you don't have any money left, you know, and don't look back. Uh, you know, uh, we take them in, we uh, help them to get sober, we give them new ways of looking at things, we, you know, we work our butts off with them to help them get better, uh, and then know that we're going to send them back into a system where they have very little chance of success, the, you know, the deck stack uh, against them because nothing has changed at home. Uh, 
there was a little girl in treatment some years ago, a long time ago, actually, back in the 80s. And I, and I went, to, uh, I had encountered her inpatient. Uh, and I'm not a, I wasn't working as an inpatient counselor. counselor. I was just pinch hitting for another counselor in um, Bowling Green Treatment Center over inside the loop. And uh, uh, here was this young woman who was in their own adolescent unit. And one of the nurses, when I came in, she said, you got to watch that uh, stepfather of hers. She said, I came in and he was laying across the bed with her. Uh, and I'm like, oh, what was going on there? And she said, well, there wasn't anything going on that I could see, you know, but he was laying across the bed with her. And uh, she had upped in group that this guy had gotten high with her. Uh, and then when CPS got involved, she denied it. Uh, and so there was just this sort of thing happening. Uh, when uh, uh, I met her mother, uh, who came uh, to visit. Her mother was there, too. And her mother looked like she had uh, stepped off the set of uh, Three's Company uh, with hot pants and the glitter on her boobs and the tank top that said Tonight's Delight on it. Uh, and I thought, boy, this kid is doomed. You know, she's got to go back, uh, go back to this. Uh, and... Uh, it's not going to work out well for her. And now, I don't know that for a fact. I, you know, and I'm just there for that day. But that's the kind of things that sometimes you encounter uh, working with uh, adolescents. And there's not a whole lot that you can uh, uh, that you can do about it. Very often, as a teenager who provides egress to dysfunctional families and with other clientele that we work with as a kid getting in trouble with school that gets the family into the system and the family getting into the system what devolves them down to us and the things that uh, uh, that we do uh, um, 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 activities of company and drinking clinical approaches. Uh, we've talked about those already. Talked about confidentiality being different, and it is different. Uh, you know, I can exercise more confidentiality with adults than I can uh, with, uh, with adolescents, with teenagers, because like that 15-year-old who was sneaking out, there are things that they say uh, that I can't keep confidential uh, if they're planning on hurting themselves or someone else. I can't keep that confidential. Uh, and there are other things that I do keep confidential, and that really annoys the hell out of uh, parents. If you've got a 16-year-old in treatment, he's entitled or she is entitled to all the confidentiality that you would afford to uh, uh, an adult, really. And at 16 in Texas, a kid can come in and seek treatment on their own. They don't need mom and dad's permission. And this drives mom and dad crazy uh, sometimes. And I have had mom and dad up in my face saying, you know, God damn it, I'm writing the check for this, and you tell me what's going on with this kid. Uh, and I can't, you know, I can't... Uh, uh, divulge, uh, you know, confidential information. Uh, be familiar, get familiar, stay familiar with the confidentiality requirements and regulations here in Texas where you're going to be licensed. They change from time to time, but not very often. Uh, federal and state regulations address confidentiality. Some years back, during the AIDS epidemic, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we had conflicting guidelines, uh, duty to warn and protect, uh, to tell, uh, uh, you know, uh, authorities if someone ha has, uh, you know, notify health officials if someone's HIV positive, et cetera, and so forth, uh, partner notifications and things like that got 
intertwined with uh, uh, and ran a, a, a foul of federal regulations that says you do not disclose a person's HIV status to anyone for any reason, you know. Uh, and that's uh, been sorted out. Uh, you and I, we don't have to worry about that too much because uh, once diagnosed, the, uh, there's the uh, our partner notification programs that take that over. We don't have to do it anymore. But uh, uh, sometimes you have laws that conflict with each other or uh, ethical issues that conflict with each other, and you got to walk through them. Uh, Screening instruments that are used. They're, they're different. Craft, jazzy, uh, twerk, uh, number of different screening instruments that you can do with adolescents or that you can do with family members of adolescents to make determinations of the nature and severity of what's going on uh, in the family. And that will help you to make a determination of how to proceed and what treatment you should, uh, uh, outcomes you should work toward. But harm reduction for those who use alcohol. Again, this is tricky ground, harm reduction for teenagers because, uh, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I've talked this kid into, uh, you know, smoking three cigarettes a week instead of, uh, you know, a half a pack or whatever. So therefore, uh, it's not as bad a deal as it was before. Uh, and that may not work with kids. Uh, you know, there's certain things, and they mentioned some here, some drugs, inhalants, opiates, amphetamines, uh, street drugs, at uh, all of these places, uh, a teen at risk. Inhalants is one that really just creeps me out still when I see kids doing things like white out and uh, acrylics and paint thinner and that sort of thing uh, because they're really dangerous drugs and uh, uh, you know it doesn't take long for an inhalant abuser to develop organic symptomology, some really serious brain damage that occurs from using those uh, uh, products. And, the, and they pose a risk every time they use them. There's a huge risk of overdose. Vaping too, you know, there, there's, uh, the jury's out on that vaping stuff. The, one of the worst ideas of the early 21st century so far is vaping. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these are issues that you have to deal with with teenagers in an in inventive way. Uh, you have to do something to stop this. You have to do something to get in the way of it. You have to notify people, and that becomes uh, an issue. Cutting down doesn't cut it. Um, some questions and stuff that you can ask. You may see those again sometime. Uh, negotiate follow-up for substance use problems, treatment. Uh, like I said, when you get kids in treatment, uh, you know, treatment should be respectful of them and who they are and where they are in their development, etc. and so forth. Uh, there are different populations than working with uh, adults. There are different requirements to working with teenagers than there is for adults. There are different regulations and laws governing how we uh, work with teenagers than with adults. And different diagnostic uh, criteria and different assessment tools. Should we talk to teenagers about issues like abortion, if you happen to be pregnant? Should we give little Cindy Lou, who's 15, uh, the option of contacting Planned Parenthood or uh, seeing some other uh, doctor to uh, terminate the pregnancy or should she have to have the baby and either 
keep it or put it up for adoption? Should we uh, talk to teenagers about birth control? Should we make condoms and birth control pills available uh, to middle adolescents and maybe even younger? Uh, you know, should we teach them about condoms and spermicidals and things like that? Should we teach them about the morning after pill? Should we teach them about things that they can do there? Should we teach them about uh, how to use drugs safely? If they're using injectables, how to clean their needles so that they don't uh, uh, get uh, uh, an infection of some sort. Uh, these are issues that, uh, you know, uh, they come up uh, and they're very um, important issues. And the answers to these questions are important answers uh, in terms of how uh, you're going to proceed with any particular case that, you, uh, that you're working with, how you feel about it, what you, what you can live with. Uh, and uh, and uh, there have been efforts in Texas uh, to prevent anyone uh, who's funded by federal money from saying anything to any client, teenager or adult, that abortion is, uh, is an option, is something that you could consider, uh, which I think is silly, repressive, and inhumane, personally. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, other people feel differently. Other people feel like, you know, we, we shouldn't do that, that there are other things that outride the, the needs of this individual, what have you. Uh, so, uh, that. <sighs> What else can I say about adolescent treatment? <laughs> oh, co-occurring psychiatric disorders with adolescents. This is something else. One of the key things that you see with adolescents coming into treatment in substance abuse programs is they may have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD and prescribed Ritalin or Adderall or something along those lines. Uh, some uh, uh, clients come in and they're not too much with adolescents, but with other uh, but with other uh, populations where uh, they may be taking uh, um, an abuse disulfiram. Uh, which, uh, you know, will make you sick as hell if you drink alcohol while you're taking this drug. And it's given to people as a, as a uh, uh, medical manage, as a medical option to keep people from drinking. Uh, adolescents uh, if you're diagnosed with a mental illness and Adolescents, chances are pretty good you're going to be misdiagnosed. And so you may be diagnosed with ADHD and it might go up to bipolar and you may be diagnosed schizophrenic before it's over. I don't think that that's funny. I'm not laughing at that. Uh, the, the issue is that we have kids who come in who need to be, uh, who need to be medicated and we have kids who come in who are over-medicated and don't need to be. Uh, so that's always a real trip uh, with, uh, with working with uh, kids in the medical community. Adolescents in AA, uh, you know, there are young people's groups in AA and there are Alateen for kids who are in a, uh, uh, chemically dependent homes where there's alcoholism. But it's... Uh, not the alcoholism of the child, etc., and these support groups. Uh, the uh, AA has traditionally not been something that uh, teenagers have taken to. Teenagers have been remarkably unsuccessful uh, with going to adult AA groups, and that's one of the reasons there was a Palmer drug abuse program popped up in the first place for these uh, for these youngsters. Uh, adolescents and AIDS, 
actually. Uh, adolescents are every bit as risk at much at risk for sexually transmitted diseases as any other population, uh, and even more so. Uh, even though you may rock along and go 15, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17 years before you ever have your first sexual encounter, uh, first sexual encounter with a partner anyway, and uh, uh, you probably won't go anything like that before you have your second one or your third one or your fourth one. In other words, uh, you know, once uh, once that possibility is out in the world, is something that's gone back to over and over. Uh, again, uh, casual sex uh, is uh, is something that happens with uh, a, a young adult population. It happens with uh, uh, with an adolescent population as well. Uh, it happens with all human beings. Human beings are uh, sexual creatures. Uh, if you are not practicing safe sex, then you are practicing at-risk sexual behaviors, and it's not uncommon for people to get STDs. And some of the STDs can be very nasty uh, illnesses indeed. AIDS is not in the rearview mirror. Uh, in the 21st century is still out there, is still affecting people, still killing people. Uh, treatment outcome. We like to do the things that, uh, uh, you know, that are evidence-based with treatment with adolescents, and we like to do um, things that are evidence-based in prevention of substance use uh, with adoles adolescents. Uh, and there are, uh, uh, again, there are all kinds of uh, treatment options. There are all kinds of preventions that are out there. And uh, like I said, you'll learn more about tertiary prevention, indicated prevention, universal pre prevention, et cetera, in your, uh, in your other classes. Uh, but uh, all of these are evidence-based, and they have strategies that have been replicated, they have been uh, uh, studied, they've been proven to be effective, uh, and there's no use reinventing the wheel, although uh, people are always looking for new and better uh, approaches. Something's going on with this stupid computer again that's going to giving me a little grief here. I should be looking at a printed page, but you see what we're looking at. Um, my guess on this is I have no internet connection. I do, huh? Well, this is embarrassing. Hang with me just a second, guys. I hate these pregnant pauses, but uh, there, there we have it. Let me see if this takes me forward to where we need to go. I think it did. Um, Okay, uh, anyway, how to evaluate the problem. I'm going to let y'all read all that for yourself. Um, substance abuse problems, treatment. Yes, that's what I was talking about. Uh, 
diagnostic criteria, adult uh, adolescent differences, again, uh, you know, adolescents develop the illness faster than adults do. It manifests itself in more virulent ways. Uh, and uh, when you do an assessment uh, with, uh, with uh, a child who's likely to be uh, chemically dependent with a teenager who's likely to be uh, chemically dependent, the same symptomologies will show up that you may see with a, a, an adult in a latter stage, but there won't be that indication of, uh, of progression that you would see in a, in a prescribed manner that you would see with, uh, with an adult because of that uh, more rapid onset uh, and development that you find with kids. You also find patterns of use that are different with adolescents. Uh, adolescents tend to drink uh, to, to, to get drunk. <laughs> they, uh, uh, we have keggers out in the field and things like that. We drink as much as we can and as fast as we can to get as drunk as we can in a short time. Uh, okay, here I am back where, where I needed to be. I was. Is it going to do it to me again? Yes, it's going to do it to me again. I don't know why. I, 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 yeah, we talked about that. Adolescents and AIDS, we talked about that. Prevention, we talked about that. I know if some of you are thinking, well, I can go get a snack here before this guy gets oriented again. Maybe. Uh, being a community resource, you're that whether you want to be or not. <laughs> so if you're working with adolescents, uh, you know, if you're doing things uh, uh, out in the uh, treatment world, uh, then, you know, people in your community may come to you. You're, you're a clinician, you're an expert, you're the person that the guy on the street wants to come to you. What can I do about my kid? He's doing this stuff. Uh, uh, always stay as updated as, as you can on uh, current information, current trends and treatment, what's available in your community, or, uh, or etc. Uh, always shoot straight uh, with the, with your uh, clients, with the people who come to you for information. There's no need uh, to resort to you know. Uh, sales pitches or scare tactics or anything like that, uh, you know, but just uh, lay it on the line with them. Uh, offer to, uh, to help when you can. Uh, be an advocate for recovery when you can. And, uh, you know, uh, realism. That's what you need to bring to the table. Uh, talk to parents about what they can and they can't do. Uh, and uh, they're going to feel real guilty if it's the parents coming in anyway. And uh, the, the thought that's going through their head is, I was a lousy parent, I should have done this differently, etc. and so forth. This is all my fault. Uh, and sometimes the kids reinforce that. Uh, what else do I want to say about adolescence? Don't be one. <laughs> That's the best thing I can tell you. Uh, but if you are one, be of good cheer. Uh, you'll probably get through it. Guys, I don't know what to tell you about this. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm having technical difficulties. I don't know what to do about them. I'm not a computer person. Uh, in fact, uh, what I'd really like to do to this computer, you know, I wouldn't want my child to know about. Uh, it would involve murdering it and, uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, but, ah, uh, here we go. I don't know where we are. Uh, 
teens' use of nicotine, uh, smoking cessation. Uh, again, uh, I'll reiterate that of all of the drugs that we freak out about, the fentanyl at the border, uh, the you know the uh, the the opiates that everybody, the other opiates that everyone's overdosing on, the. the uh, you know, whatever the booger bear drug of choice is, this, you know, booger bear du jour, uh, the fact remains that alcohol and nicotine are our biggest drug problems in this country. Uh, they're the biggest drug problems among preteens, adolescents, adults, older adults, etc., in the United States of America. Uh, nicotine kills almost half a million Americans, uh, uh, you know, annually. Uh, so it's a big, de it's a big deal. Uh, and, it, and vaping and e-cigarettes and stuff like that are thrown in on top of that. It's not healthy alternatives to smoking. There are no healthy alternatives to smoking. Uh, so, you know, if you, sm uh, if, you, uh, if you don't smoke, don't start. If you do smoke, quit. Uh, and do what you can to help your clients to, to stop smoking. Had a friend of mine, Gary H., he's a former roommate of mine, uh, who uh, uh, actually, uh, we worked for the same agency for a while, and Gary had smoking cessation clinics, uh, and Gary smoked. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, while outside taking a break one time and having a cigarette, uh, one of his clients asked him, how can you do this? How can you, you know, go in there and tell us about the uh, hazards of smoking and how to stop smoking, etc., and so forth, and you still smoke? He said, I don't want to quit. <laughs> uh, so, college students. Once upon a time in the 80s, uh, a young lady... Uh, from San Jacinto College came down to the place where I was working and wanted to uh, uh, question me about my career as a substance abuse uh, professional. Uh, and I said, sure, come on in. And she was a very nice and cordial young lady. And she asked me, what kind of things do you do particularly uh, for college students? And I was gratified to be able to answer promptly, and I did. I said nothing. I treat a college student just like any other client, uh, which was true. And which, to a large extent, you know, is true because the people I work with most of the time nowadays are college students. I'm a teacher, you know. But uh, y'all knew that. But... Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, with special populations, the reason that we're talking about this chapter, the reason that I'm doing this now, is that there are concerns that are unique to these populations that, if addressed, will enhance our ability to help these individuals and will enhance their likelihood of a positive outcome. Uh, what could we do to help out college students in terms of preventions, etc. Uh, well, you know, we have programs that uh, with four-year universities that fit into, uh, you know, um, the Greek life. If you're in a university or fraternity, if you're staying in, uh, uh, you know, campus dormitories, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of times when uh, people go away from home to live in a university and do things, they go a little bit hog wild, you know. Uh, and there's lots of binge drinking and binge drug use that uh, occur on campus that we, could, that we could and should address. Among our clients who come to us from uh, our campus situations, and this is something else that we need to look at in terms of campus life, in terms of what goes on in campus, is the high, high, high incident of sexual assault and rape that takes place on college campuses. And uh, 
there's much more of it going on than the schools themselves would ever like anyone to know. There is a, a film uh, that if you want to watch it and send me a, I, yeah, I'll post you something on, in, in your classroom to tell you about this so you can watch it and, uh, uh, and I'll uh, give you extra credit for it. It's called The Hunting Ground. Uh, and it's about sexual assault on campus. And one of the things that we need to know about that is if you watch that film, it is astonishing to, to listen to these uh, young women and occasionally men who are victims of sexual assault, and the story begins, I was at this party and I drank too much. I'm not blaming uh, uh, victims on this. What I'm saying is that there is a dovetail and intersection of alcohol and drug abuse and sexual assault that takes place, that's all. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're addressing one, you might as well address the other. Nishvar? Uh, so, we'll see. There are, and I'm happy to report this, a lot more, uh, of, uh, a lot more of, uh, support groups and things like that on campuses now, uh, to help people stay sober. And there are dry dormitories, you know, drug-free, uh, uh, dormitories where people can live. Gender differences, different, uh, uh, you know, women are less likely to use illicit substances, uh, men are more likely to be smokers. Racial and ethnic differences, there's plenty of them. Uh, we are not going to be experts on uh, diversity, uh, but uh, we are asked today to have cultural humility, and cultural humility basically uh, uh, refers to my ability to be teachable, to learn from, to suspend judgment, to uh, 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 to try to understand uh, the concerns of um, and the differences between races and ethnicities in their experiences. Uh, we'll talk about that some more in other classes as well. There's been a general decline in alcohol and drug use since the 80s, which is odd because that's about the time I quit in 1982. I like to think I had something to do with that. Uh, and even though we look at the situation today and say, you know, oh my, it's terrible, it's probably the worst it's ever been, it's not. The worst it's ever been was in the late 70s uh, and right through, uh, you know, the uh, early, uh, early 80s, until about 82. Uh, binge drinking, we've talked about that a lot already. I don't think I need to hammer on that anymore. Uh... Well, lovely. See, if I were back in Texas and I were making this video, even though the page is coming up for you to see, I would have my textbook in my lap and you would hear the pages rustle. And I would continue talking on the topic. I don't know if it's really going anywhere. It says page 403 and it's staying there. Okay, you know what? 
I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to post this part uh, on uh, in your, I'm going to post this in your, uh, this week, whatever the hell it is. Uh, and I'll complete this when I get back to Texas tomorrow. So, have fun. I'll talk to you then. I'm a little bit annoyed. This is what annoyed looks like. Uh, so, okay. Sayonara.